Please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Ronald Arkin. Thank you very much, Joanne. And it's a pleasure and an honor to be here uh, tonight and to be invited by the academies to uh, uh, give this talk. I do kind of feel like this will be a trial by my peers uh, here, judging by the audience. Uh, and also, uh, I have to admit that uh, Delta uh, is doing much better because in my last flight uh, before this one, it was only delayed 12 hours. And this flight, this flight was delayed two hours. So I guess they're, they're, uh, they're doing better in that respect. Um, I do have to say, uh, I will talk a little bit about my research. Uh, there's a lot of policy and other issues that will be spoken of today. The research is important, but the discussion that the research engenders is equally, if not more important as well, too. And I'm hoping that's what you'll take with you, as opposed to the specific technical details, which I actually am not going to go into uh, here. You can find them on our web pages and in my book, uh, if you're uh, so interested. Um, talking about ethics. There's quite often a time that you will offend people talking about killing. It's uh, even more likely uh, as well. Um, but again, that's part of getting the discussion going. This is a version of a talk I've given to so many different audiences. I lose track. Uh, the most recent one was the Association of Christians in Mathematical Sciences, a keynote uh, I gave uh, for that. I've given different versions at the Pentagon. I've presented this before the International Committee of the Red Cross many different uh, military organizations and universities uh, and uh, uh, industry around the uh, world uh, as well. So I'm happy to be able to share this with you. And thank you for, again for that opportunity to be able to do so. So let's begin. Um, first, war is bad, OK? Let's, let's put that on the table. War is something that we don't want to do. I am completely and utterly anti-war, although you may not believe it after you hear how I talk about certain things uh, here. But there are two fundamental assumptions in the work that I'll be talking about. One is that wars will continue. They have continued from time immemorial, despite Immanuel Kant's talking about the ability to generate peace among devils uh, and others as well, too. Uh, and I often and continue to encourage pacifists uh, who, again, may feel strongly about some of the things that I say, uh, to continue uh, in their efforts to find ways to keep mankind uh, from killing each other uh, in the battlefield. And I guess it's womankind as well now, too, since we have women uh, eligible for service in combat uh, at this point. But the question is not whether we should have wars or not. The question I'm confronting you today with is, assuming that these wars will continue, how and when and where and if robotics technology should be used. You all know it's being used, right? I mean, you see it in the news almost every day. Uh, reapers and predators and all kinds of different technology is fighting your battles uh, and your children's battles uh, instead of them at this point in time. This is important. The real question is, and I'm not going to get into the political question. I'm going to get into the ethical questions from my point of view. Uh, is are we doing it in a manner that is consistent with the ways in which civilization over the last thousand or two thousand years has agreed that we should kill each other? This speaks to the question of how I got interested in this. I've been a roboticist for a pretty long time. I, uh, my gray hairs show it, and I've been, or what's left of them, uh, and I've been doing it uh, since uh, 1984. So what's that, 30 years uh, in terms of uh, roboticists. Uh, in terms of robotics. But more recently, the interesting thing was, I didn't start worrying about these issues until around a decade ago. And why? Well, we were actually starting to succeed as a community. The work that we were doing was actually getting out of the laboratory and making an impact in the real world. In the early days, we just worried about, could a robot get from point A to point B and back without crashing into something? Indeed, my first robot we named Harv after Harvey Wallbanger uh, as the uh, uh, appropriate acronym, which also stood for H-A-R-V, which stood for Hardly Autonomous Robot Vehicle. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, and that was actually a fair characterization at this point in time. But the progress has been significant, uh, quite significant. And uh, I have felt as a consequence of this and seeing the impact and the bleeding over out of the laboratories into the real world, a need to both educate my colleagues 
uh, in terms of the impact of the work and educate myself uh, and others, uh, the, uh, everyone basically about what is happening in this particular field. And I want to say that robot ethics deals with far more uh, than robots in the battlefield. Uh, it deals with issues of privacy, which you're hearing in the use of drones. It, it deals with robot intimacy, which is something that's often a very touchy subject to talk about, but one that does need to be talked about uh, as well. Uh, it deals with a, uh, a host of different things. I teach a whole class for a semester on, uh, on this particular topic. So it's an important one. But the most pressing one in my mind uh, is the military aspects. So I went to, I had the honor of attending the first Robot and Ethics Symposium in San Remo, Italy, which was an invitation I couldn't refuse, um, in January of 2004. Uh, and not only were there a few roboticists such as myself there, but there was a representative for the Vatican. Uh, there were folks from the International Committee of the Red Cross. And I'm sitting in the audience and I'm learning the right caliber of bullet to kill people with, which is ethically appropriate. I did not know that before. For those of you who are unaware of that fact, it's a fat, slow bullet, not a small, high-speed bullet. And it has to do with the size of the exit wound that's created. In other words, you have to be able to recover from a wound. And certain high-speed projectiles or dum-dums, a different type of bullet which have been banned for a long, long time, uh, are considered inhumane uh, in terms of the ways in which you dispatch people. I also learned there's other things since then, such as blinding lasers. You may not know uh, that blinding lasers uh, are illegal to use uh, in the battlefield. They have been banned by treaty internationally through the uh, protocols of uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross, which houses the Geneva Conventions. Um, and it's, uh, it's interesting. You can get shot in the eye, but you can't get blinded in the eye. And I think many people might prefer one over the other, including myself. But it has to do, again, with recovery and other factors, which have, having spoken to the people that developed that protocol, I still scratch my head a little bit uh, about that. So anyway, I learned a lot from that. And it kind of mobilized me. I, got, I, I was one of the uh, co-founding uh, uh, chairs of the Technical Committee on Robot Ethics. Uh, I've uh, now serve, uh, I have served on the Board of Governors for the IEEE Social Implications of Technology, as you heard, I'm a distinguished lecturer there uh, now as well too, um, and uh, a variety of different aspects to try and enable me to, is it vent my guilt? I don't know. It's, it's a question of being able to express this and to mobilize a community in terms of what's going on. And we have different answers to this, many people do. Uh, and there was one particular video, which time permits at the end, I'm not going to show because it's too gruesome to show, but came up at a small Navy meeting uh, where we're talking about the futures uh, that came directly back from the battlefield uh, that also was a little bit of a tipping point in terms of what could and shouldn't be done. And if time permits, I'll get back to that. So why is the military, and I don't mean just our military, there's 50 plus nations right now that are either using, developing, uh, or uh, having deployed uh, robotics technology in the battlefield. So we are not alone by any stretch. We are more open with the kinds of technology, and I would say we have, with the possible exception of Israel, a substantial uh, lead uh, in this uh, particular space. But why are they so enamored with it? Well, these are the major reasons. One is you could have one warfighter, and by warfighter as opposed to soldier, I mean air, sea, ground, uh, surface as well too, so it speaks to all the services. Um, you can reduce the number of warfighters needed. So one warfighter, or one soldier, if it's a ground-based system, uh, can do the work of three or four. It's not intended in current deployment strategies to remove the Terminator vision of having robot armies swarming across, across the countryside, not so. The intention is to provide adjuncts to the warfighter, to do the things that are particularly dangerous and particularly harmful and risky, to alleviate their risk and to en enable their mission to be accomplished more effectively. Um, I have to also say one other thing, uh, just to make sure I say it as well too. I have the utmost respect for our young men and women in the battlefield. They are put into situations, however, that no human being was ever designed uh, to uh, function within. This is getting worse. It's exacerbated by modern warfare, by the fact that the tempo of the battlefield is increasing faster and faster, and expecting rational decisions within that time frame is becoming harder and harder to, to deal with. Most of our soldiers perform very, very well, 
but we'll see some do not. And we'll see that you can see the effects of this already in not only our conflicts, but in other conflicts that are ongoing uh, within the world. But anyway, I'll get back to that. Uh, the other is to expand the battle space, which means we can fight over larger and longer areas. We have uh, people sitting in Nevada right now, flying missions uh, in, uh, well, who knows where, Pakistan, Yemen, uh, Iraq, uh, uh, Pac uh, in uh, uh, other places conceivably as well too. I will also say this, uh, I do not have a security clearance. It enables me to say, what I know freely and openly, uh, and I do not want one uh, as well, although I have been requested on several times to uh, go and do that, because an academic, I believe, has an obligation to be able to speak freely and to publish freely about the works uh, that they do. Uh, that doesn't mean that everyone likes what I say. Uh, uh, extending the warfighter's reach. This deals with both perception, to be able to look around a corner or to engage around a corner and to keep your head down and let the robot assume the risk uh, in this particular case. The net effect, of course, is reducing friendly casualties. But what has been missing in this algebra is the effect on non-combatants. The whole notion of what can we do in the battle space to reduce non-combatant casualties and civilian damage and the damage to civilian property, which are protected by the laws of war, the Geneva Conventions, Hague Conventions, and others as well, too. What can we do to protect them? I believe technology can play a fundamental role uh, in that, and we'll talk more about that as time goes on. But these are some older pictures of some of the systems. Um, let's see, this, I use these to often wake up my uh, audiences. I didn't mean that loud. <laughs> but, the, the point is there are these arm platforms which function on the ground. Some are conceptual there, some in the air, some most, actually virtually all that are deployed are teleautonomous or uh, teleoperated systems right now. There is what's called a human in the loop. To me that phrase is actually red herring. You hear it quite often. I'll talk more about that uh, in a bit as well too. But there's all kinds of platforms uh, that have been developed. And again, as I mentioned, not only in this country, but in many other countries as well too. China has them, Russia has them, the French have them, um, uh, Israel has plenty of them uh, as, as well too, um, and South Korea has ones that are actually being deployed. I'll talk a little bit more about that later time permitting along the demilitarized zone uh, for a specific application. I spent four months in uh, uh, South Korea, interesting visiting the DMZ I might say. But looking at the kinds of platforms that our country is developing. This is just a list from 2009 of the force-bearing U.S. unmanned systems unclassified uh, list. Some are actually fielded. You'll see the MQ-1, uh, which is the Predator, and the MQ-9, uh, the Reapers, and uh, new ones, or the Avengers can be added to this as well, too. Many more are under development. This is an important issue. And what has happened is a consequence of this rapid growth into what some refer to as a revolution in military affairs, an RMA, which is, hasn't been declared that this is an RMA yet. Uh, aircraft carriers were RMAs. Battleships were RMAs. Gunpowder was an RMA. The longbow was an RMA. They fundamentally changed the way in which wars were fought. Many people believe that robotics technology will do the same. We don't know exactly how, but we believe it will. Um, as a consequence of that, uh, some very recent developments, uh, some of which I've been more involved with uh, than others, Human Rights uh, Watch uh, has, as a product of their interaction with another group, the International Committee of the Robot Arms Control, ICRAC as, as they refer to themselves, has called for an outright ban on all autonomous, lethal autonomous systems. I'm going to say these things without commenting as best I can uh, in, in terms of that. They've called for an outright ban. Um, the U.S. Department of Defense, about the same time, uh, developed what I call, it's called a directive, and it's actually a quasi-moratorium where they basically say, we're going to use these systems for defense. And there are certain examples, uh, such as the uh, Phalanx system, which is deployed on Aegis-class cruisers, which uh, typically, if a sea, supersonic sea-skimming missile is coming at you, unlike in World War II, where you could call up 
the captain, captain, I got a bogey at three o'clock, send up a couple of fighters and see what's going on. Probably by the time you call the captain, uh, that uh, missile has uh, crashed into your ship. And you, so you turn these things on. And they actually deployed these also in the green zone uh, in Iraq uh, to knock down uh, mortars as they were being flied in. So it has, these are systems that fire autonomously. Uh, but they are, they're continuing to allow the development of so-called defensive systems, but other kinds of systems they are saying, we're going to wait 10 years before we develop and deploy these, um, and we are going to revisit that in five years to see if it should be extended further. Um, another one by the Special Rapporteur, uh, Christoph Haynes, on targeted assassinations and something else, I can't remember. I was at the expert meeting in Florence uh, this January before this report uh, was released, uh, deals more uh, with the issues with a moratorium. They call for the nations to issue a moratorium basically to say, don't do it until we can do it right, if at all. Okay, so take a breath, pause, hit the pause button is one good way to describe it. So these, these are things that are not just scientific curiosities, but these are things that are really getting play in the political, uh, social uh, sphere uh, as well too, and the military side of things as well. The uh, DOD has been aware of this, and what's interesting is this unmanned systems roadmap was extended from 2009 to 2034. For those of you who are business people, I doubt that you ever created a plan that went out 35 years. Uh, I'm not sure that's a, a wise thing to do in terms of the out years. Is it really going to hold up? But the thing that this shows is a very strong commitment by the Department of Defense to this particular type of technology. And notice they also say that the decision to fire will not likely be fully automated until legal rules of engagement and safety concerns have all been thoroughly examined and resolved. The Air Force is even further looking outwards. They go for to 2047, so that's 48 years they created their flight plan. You see, for ground robots you do a road map, for the air robots you do a flight plan. Uh, so it's a, a, a different sort of thing. But they acknowledge the same thing, that ethical discussions and policy decisions must take place in the near term, rather than allowing the development to take its own path apart from this critical guidance. This is important. This is one of the things that I've been trying to encourage people to do. I tend not to be prescriptive. I do present an alternative option, which I will discuss with you later today as well too. But it's not for a roboticist to decide. It's not for an individual to decide. It's not for a general to decide. It may be for a president to decide, I don't know. But it, it is something that has to be discussed uh, in the broader community as we move forward. And as I mentioned, the UN also has said the same thing, that they have really not examined these issues, the ethical questions, deeply and thoroughly. So let's turn to the plight of the non-combatant. Okay, and this is important from my point of view. This is where my concerns come in. Will this technology, when it's introduced, put non-combatants at greater risk than they currently are. And they currently are at great risk. Uh, and I'll talk about that in, in a bit as well, too. There's many reasons, um, apart from the fact that you're killing non-participants, innocent people, so to speak, in the uh, battle space. You can get war crime charges. Uh, you've seen, how do you feel when you see these things on, reported on CNN? Not very good, right? Uh, you want change. The troops don't feel well about it either. And it creates hostility and citizen reticence as well, too. All sorts of bad effects associated uh, with uh, the use of lethal force. That's not autonomous lethal force. I'm just saying existing use of lethal force, okay, with our current uh, war fighters. So, can technology assist? And here is the second assumption of the work that I refer to. The, this assumption is that lethal autonomy is inevitable. Now, this is debated widely in my, in my community. Uh, I've even had one of my counterparts uh, publish a paper, the evitability of autonomous, of lethal autonomous robots. So, I guess he doesn't believe they are inevitable. But I believe they're inevitable because they already exist. Okay, so if they already exist, how can you say they won't? They do, and so why do I say they already exist? Well, I told you one example already, the phalanx system on Aegis class cruisers, but even, it depends on how you define a robot, even something as simple as an anti-personnel mine can be considered a robotic platform. What do robots do? They sense, you have a pressure plate on that, it senses the world, and they actuate, okay? They actuate in a rather crude manner, uh, and those systems have been banned uh, by most nations, not ours, not China, not Russia, by the Ottawa Convention. 
but uh, the anti-personnel ones because they lack one important characteristic that is inherent in the Geneva Conventions, which is that of distinction or discrimination. You can't tell if that's a combatant stepping on that mine. It could be a child. It could be an innocent uh, as well, too. Uh, but we haven't signed on board, although we tend to subscribe. We do subscribe to these, and most people I talk to say our nation subscribes to the Geneva Conventions, although we didn't sign the 1977 versions uh, either. Um, we subscribe to them better than anyone else. At least that's what I hear. Okay, we try, but we're not legally bound uh, to do so. You try getting a treaty through Congress. You try getting anything through Congress. I'll make that, make that my political statement uh, uh, for the night. Uh, uh, so there's this notion, this definition of a human in the loop. You may hear it uh, from time to time. That means a human is in control. Well, I call this a red herring because a human will always be in control. It's just a question at one level. Will that individual be pushing the button and making a target ID to release that weapon uh, when it's necessary? Well, imagine you have the entire North Korean army coming across the uh, uh, DMZ. Well, uh, either that individual is going to be, pardon the language, playing whack-a-mole uh, on that and just pushing the button without thinking it and uh, not doing discrimination, uh, or it will be automated under those sets of circumstances. Um, the Air Force has even changed the language, talking about a human on the loop. And the real trend is leader in the loop, because these systems will always be tasked, just as war fighters are tasked. You tell a soldier what to do. You don't say, okay, do what you want uh, and uh, uh, figure it out. Maybe you do in some cases. And sometimes that can learn to bad, end up in bad ways, which we will see uh, in a bit. But people sometimes make bad decisions. And because of this increasing tempo of the battlefield, it's getting worse in my estimation. So uh, that leads to these two rhetorical questions, please. Um, should soldiers be robots? Isn't that largely what they are trained to be? It's hard to make a human being kill. You actually have to change their way of thinking. And if you look at the statistics from the wars, I, you know, as part of this, as a roboticist, I have always studied ethology, which is the study of animals in their natural environment. I've used that for squirrels and frogs and dogs and people as well too. But one natural environment we studied, I had to study, uh, was uh, the human beings in their natural environment, which is the battlefield uh, as well too. And in many cases, not all, but some, we behave atrociously, literally atrociously, which refers to uh, the uh, uh, generation of uh, injuries uh, to uh, uh, com non-combatants uh, and or those which are otherwise hors de combat, which means they have surrendered or have uh, gained non-combatant stature, uh, stature by virtue of wound. So do we try and change our soldiers to be more obedient and to be less reluctant to engage the targets? And if you look at some of these things, you'll, you can see that most people don't end up killing. A few do, and a few are really good at it, and much of the individuals in that uh, group uh, provide support for that individual as well, too. And this goes for air and ground uh, as well. Should robots be soldiers? Now, this is the interesting premise that I uh, bring up. Um, and could they ultimately do better with respect to non-combatant casualties than human beings do? And I'll talk more about that. But the goal of the things that I'm thinking about is how can we reduce the unnecessary and atrocious behavior which from time to time manifests itself uh, in, uh, uh, in the world? And keep in mind, this exists in every war. You've heard of it in Syria, for example. You see it everywhere. It happens all the time. We, we create rules that we should kill people by. These are the Geneva Conventions. But we don't adhere to them. Not all of us do. So we try. But the point is, we are human and we fail under these sets of circumstances. Even these past two years, um, we've seen a variety of different infractions uh, occur. Uh, and this is, again, just uh, US. And this affects troop morale and other things as well, too. Incites your enemy, creates more enemy, uh, and the like uh, as well. And what's interesting is this has been well documented. And I have to give our nation credit for doing the very first uh, mental health and ethical behavior legitimate scientific study 
of the soldiers coming back uh, from uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. This was a, uh, a scientific evaluation of how they behaved and what they observed within the battle space and, and also their mental health. These numbers to me are disturbing. Um, and I, you can find them more in my papers and certainly the original report as well too. But simple things like almost one in five soldiers and Marines agreed or strongly agreed that all non-combatants should be treated as insurgents. Um, the fact that 45% of soldiers and 60% of Marines did not agree that they would report a fellow soldier Marine if he had injured or killed an innocent non-combatant. That's a war crime right there. You have to report those things. Okay. But it's easy for me to say that. I've not served in uniform. I've worked with the military for almost 30 years, but I have not served in uniform. And I know it's very difficult to be able to do this. And if you look, for example, at other studies that existed before this, which were not done as scientifically, one study, a sociological study from the returning folks from Vietnam stated that 100% of the men in heavy combat, I believe it was 33% of those in medium combat, and something like 17% of those in light combat either aided, uh, witnessed, or committed an atrocity. Consider how many people are in the battlefield. That's a lot. And this is a lot as well, too. Some people, I've, I've had argue that of 17%, that's a small number. That's not a small number if you consider how many thousands and thousands of people that we have in that battle space. Why does this occur? As I said, it's because we're human. And sometimes because we don't train people well. Uh, all kinds of things uh, go on. And there's real issues associated with how much we can eventually change our humanity, our wetware, and our capabilities to be able to comply with these philosophical edicts that have been generated through just war theory. And I've learned a lot about just war theory as well, too. Uh, what I'm referring to, for those of you who may know anything about it, is called use in bello, which is how you fight once you're in war. There are other issues called use ad bellum, which deal with the conditions for entering into warfare. Okay? It's interesting because I, I actually got to publish now in law journals and uh, ethics journals, which I never had the opportunity uh, before. So that's a slight side perk uh, uh, from that. But I do believe that I've uh, learned a good bit about this, and you have to. It's part, again, of understanding uh, the domain, which is necessary for any roboticist. So this is what I ask of my colleagues. Do we not have a responsibility? to deal with this particular problem, where we see inhumanity occurring, and we may want to turn our heads, CNN is not letting us turn our heads any longer uh, in, in this respect, do we not have a responsibility to try and do something about it? I'll present one approach that I tried, and I'm not just going to say these are baby steps, there may be other steps and other ways to be able to deal with this particular problem, but I want my community to address the plight of the non-combatant. I want them to deal with the fact that innocent people are being killed during the waging of war just by the fact that they are caught in that particular battle space. So how can it happen? Well, this, I did a three-year project, ended in, uh, about five years ago, actually, and it was this, one of the smallest DOD grants I ever had. I have three different grants right now from the Department of Defense, completely unrelated to ethics work, which, each of which is three times as large as, as this particular one. But this relatively small grant has gotten the most play, I would say, of almost all the work uh, that I have done, partly probably because it's controversial uh, in its approach. Um, but the underlying thesis, and notice that's a thesis. It's not proven. The question that I was asking and the research question I was asking is, can robots act more humanely than human beings in certain types of military situations? I was studying that particular problem. And I don't believe and sometimes people set an unreasonable measure for anyone's behavior that you have to be completely perfect. I don't believe these systems will be completely perfect. I do believe that they will make mistakes. But the question from my point of view, and there's a, a deontological versus utilitarian ethics which could be put to play here. Um, sorry if I don't explain those for you. One's rights-based versus consequences associated with it. Um, but if these can outperform human warfighters, in certain circumstances, not all circumstances, and I'm not talking about the replacement one-on-one -on -one of robots for human soldiers. If they can, that can end up, hopefully without mission erosion, 
in a reduction in non-combatant casualties and hence a saving of life. And to me, that's a humanitarian effort. So when I first started this project, uh, the economist uh, uh, caught on to it. And they wrote a nice article as well, too. But they had this picture, which kind of kind of captured tongue in cheek what I was trying to do. OK? So how can we basically plug in the ethics upgrade uh, to these kinds of systems to make sure that they do not stray outside, even under human control, outside the bounds that other humans and society and international law has dictated as appropriate uh, behavior. So in the proposal, these are the sorts of things that I was interested in doing. Give a robot the right to refuse an order. Hmm. That's, <laughs> that's not always been widely uh, lauded by the military as an appropriate thing. But if it deems it's unethical, it should not be able to engage it. Uh, it should also potentially monitor and report be behavior of others. Hmm. What happened in Vietnam when people did that? That's uh, a new verb was created, I think, called fragging. Yeah, fragging uh, in that case as well, too. You could frag the robot. Uh, and also incorporate the laws into the system to make sure that they adhere to them. Ideally, better than humans. Now, this compromises in some way the ways in which you can use these systems. But so what? The point is, are we just going to give lip service to the laws of war? Or are we actually going to do it? This is a put up or shut up scenario here. As we create these platforms, are we actually going to uh, uh, create them in a way which is consistent? And why am I optimistic that this can be done? Okay. Well, we already have robots that are smarter in some respects than human beings. We have them that are stronger. We have them that are faster. Uh, Rod Brooks, another famous roboticist uh, of, of iRobot, has said that they will be better than us in every possible way. Well, this is one way. Why is it so hard for us to think, especially in the battlefield, that a robot would treat us and non-combatants better than we would treat them? That's where humanity is often at its worst. I think it's an important thing to do. So again, you're probably familiar, or maybe not, with the Google driving car uh, that's been licensed in Nevada. Uh, also, it's illegal in Oklahoma and probably a couple of other states uh, now as well, too. So if you want to go buy one, you have uh, sell your house in Woods Hole, probably about the right price, uh, I guess, uh, to, uh, to pick one of those up uh, and, and do that. And a variety of other things as well, too. We are making advances in artificial intelligence. And I'm not saying this is something that can be achieved immediately. It's something that needs to be researched. It needs, it's something that needs to be developed. And the point is, as I said, it's a research thesis. And as soon as someone shows me that it becomes impossible to do, I will be the first to admit it. But unless we try, it's not going to be achieved. Classic research paradigm. I also argue that these systems should not be used, as I mentioned, as one-on-one -on -one replacements for robotic soldiers. They should be used for specialized missions only, kind of like animals, like dogs or mules, to carry out specific tasks in the battlefield as adjuncts to the warfighter. We need to maintain a human presence in the battlefield. It's important for the warfighters who sign up to fight. It's important for the others that are in the battle space as well, too, to win the peace, uh, so to speak. Operations include room clearing, so we don't have situations like Haditha or counter sniper operations, or as I mentioned, uh, for perimeter protection in a, a demilitarized zone. I also say that we should not be thinking about counterinsurgency operations. This is for the war after next. I can tell you some stories if it comes up in questions about uh, General Mattis, who was, uh, uh, he was head of JPO, a uh, Joint Projects uh, Office, uh, um, uh, when I heard him talking about this, a true historian, um, talking about how we cannot assume that all wars in the future will be, uh, uh, counter, uh, will it be insurgencies or counterinsurgencies, interstate warfare. You can pick right now a couple of potential adversaries that we almost had an interesting conflict, at least with one. Uh, we came relatively close in, in near times. It wasn't the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? But it was uh, um, uh, interesting posturing with nuclear weapons uh, and the like. And again, alongside. So why do I say I, this may, may be feasible? Robots do not have a right to self-defense, OK? They have a right to defend their fellow soldiers but they do not have a right to self-defense. So they can act conservatively. They can assume far more risk than any human warfighter ever would possibly do. You'd say, that's crazy. You can't go up there and do that. 
But the point is you can reveal whether that person and the hallmark characteristic in the U.S. military rules of engagement for engaging a target is you have to exhibit hostility or hostile intent. If that's been exhibited, then you can engage that target. Um, we will have better sensors for these things than human beings possibly can deal with. They'll run faster. They will not have emotions, although in some of my work I've designed, interestingly, guilt into the system. I'm, uh, in a unidirectional way. I'll leave that for the question period if you're curious about that. I've done a lot of work with emotions for robots, by the way, for things like Sony Ibo, the little robot dog, uh, and other things which deal with bonding with humans and developing intimate relationships. Uh, deep ethical questions with that as well, too. But in the battlefield, emotions cloud judgment quite often, anger, fear, hostility, uh, uh, all kinds of different aspects. Certain particular um, other aspects where you can get more information because there will be uh, what's referred to in, in military jargon as the network-centric warfare, where we will have a quasi-interneted battlefield where more information will be available from more sources than any human being possibly could, and potentially going back through what's referred to as the global information grid all the way back into Washington as well, too. This actually causes me some concern in a different area due to uh, cybersecurity and other things. Uh, no, it wasn't, the, it wasn't Skynet, that's not what I was referring to, but uh, uh, in, in terms of cybersecurity uh, aspects, uh, but that's a different problem uh, here. So all these different things, but as you can imagine, and I'm sure some of you have this point of view as well too, I have not been unchallenged uh, in my point of view. There's a bigger list here of things that argue uh, against this. And I have counter arguments uh, for all of them. Uh, the notion of responsibility, someone has to be blamed if a war crime is committed. I've written a paper, the robot didn't do it, period. Uh, it's just plain and simple, the robot didn't do it. Just as if a precision guided munition lands on a mosque or a church. It's not the bomb's fault that it happened. It's the same sort of thing here. Um, these, yeah, also, I should make clear, for those of you who have some philosophical bent, when I'm talking about autonomy in this particular case, I'm talking about the ability of the robot to pick and designate a target and engage that target, okay? I am not talking about moral agency or free will, which is the philosophical interpretation of uh, autonomy. Philosophers use that phrase uh, differently than uh, roboticists in the military does. There's a notion of lowering the threshold of warfare, very real, very common with all technological advances. Some argue it can't be done, I haven't seen why uh, yet. The questions on squad cohesion, the fragging question that we talked about uh, earlier, the, the right to refuse an order, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, we've seen, you actually have seen movies, and have been plausible, you've seen data in Star Trek, maybe you have or haven't, but data in Star Trek movies as well too. He was a robot commander, right? And people were taking his orders, so did that seem so weird to you? Uh, uh, and uh, uh, in any case, but that's not what I'm advocating building in this case. Proliferation, cybersecurity, and mission creep are several of the others. So, and we can revisit those during questions if you like. I'm, I suspect there may be some comments on that. But the real question is, what do we need to represent within the robotic system? These are the issues that we have to represent, and these are the things that are enshrined in just war theory. You've heard Obama, perhaps, uh, when he uh, accepted his Nobel Prize, talk about just war theory. He also, I believe, spoke about it uh, at his more recent drone uh, speaking as well, too. Just war theory dates back to St. Augustine, uh, and uh, it's been encoded since the 1800s in terms of laws and Geneva Conventions and Hague Conventions and other things as well, too. But the theory argues that you have to have a reason to kill. That's military necessity. You just can't kill unless there is a really military advantage that you will gain. You can't kill in a way which is inhumane. No high-speed small bullets. No blinding lasers. Uh, no dumb dumb bullets. Those sorts of things. It's odd that I, you know. The more I learn about it, there's certain percentages of weaponry you have to be able to recover from a wound. Uh, I, I don't know, was it, I can't, I just make up a number, but there was some percentage you have to recover, and if that number goes too high, if your weapon kills too many people that have been hit by it, it's illegal. Okay, I don't shoot the messenger here, with, especially with one of those bullets, uh, but uh, uh, in any case, uh, there's some strange, there's things that I don't fully understand uh, about that. Proportionality, this is why we didn't drop nuclear weapons on the Hindu Kush. You are only allowed to use as much force as necessary to accomplish the mission and not anything more. If you do things like carpet bombing, 
Nagasaki. Hmm. No, well, that's our side of things as well, too. I, I said I was not going to be judgmental, so I'm not being. I'm just saying those are the sorts of things that uh, make question, uh, be, and also because of discrimination or distinction in those particular cases. How much force is necessary to gain the, necess the military advantage that you're trying to do? So uh, you can't necessarily level a building um, just because you can uh, to, to go through some place. You may have to actually enter and clear it with war fighters. And you are instructed in the military, and rightly so, to assume risk on behalf of the non-combatant. And it's easy to say that. It's much harder to do, especially, you know, not having served. It's, it's very easy for me to say it. Um, the ways in which these are being explored, at least by our group, have involved something called action-based machine ethics. It deals with deontic logic, uh, which is a form of logic of prohibitions, permissions, and obligations, um, and the ways in which you could encode these things uh, in terms of translating the rules of, uh, of the Geneva Conventions into appropriate constraints. We use a constraint-based method to accomplish that. Um, so there has to be an obligation which is generated by a JAG lawyer. They have to be JAG lawyers that do this. It's not a roboticist that makes these decisions. Just as the JAG lawyers are the ones who write the rules of engagements for the warfighters, they will be, if this occurs, the ones that have to write these particular obligations and the particular prohibitions, what's allowed. And keep in mind, again, you can do this in what's referred to as bounded morality, in narrow situations. You're not, you don't have to encode everything in the laws of war. Okay? You just have to encode the situations that this particular robot is likely to encounter in this set of circumstances. And you can use something referred to in AI as a closed world assumption that if you don't know what it is, you don't shoot, basically. You just don't shoot. Uh, it's as simple as that. You have to know and have a good understanding before you allow that trigger to be pulled. We've developed mathematical formalisms for this uh, in terms of lethal action spaces. I've worked in behavior-based robotics since I started, and I was recasting the formalisms in this particular case, uh, transforming that into uh, 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 logical expressions, which actually in this case were first-order predicate logic. We didn't, it was surprisingly shallow, the kind of reasoning that was necessary for the kinds of domains that we were working with. Um, it's fairly straightforward to do. If you want to try, which is well beyond the scope, of any robot or any I person now to try and capture the full moral faculties of a human being. That's not possible at this point in time. But we're talking about complying with the laws of war. We're not talking about being an ethical reasoning system in this case. But there are people that are working on that as well, too. So the overall flow of control dealt with the assignment of responsibility and pre-mission planning. Understanding uh, the military necessity, is this a high value, low value, no value target uh, uh, for that, which determines, again, uh, uh, after you discriminate a particular enemy, uh, in this case, or target, whether it be a tank or an individual. Uh, we used to use, uh, we used um, aerial vehicles in our simulations. Um, then you used what we refer to as something from Michael Walzler, the principle of double intention. The principle of double intention is drawn from the principle of double effect. The principle of double effect goes back to the heart of just war theory uh, and the Middle Ages, which said that there are two effects. One is a military good that is being achieved, and the other is an evil associated with that, which may indeed involve the destruction of civilian property and the loss of civilian lives. It is not a war crime to kill a civilian. It is a war crime to intentionally kill a civilian. Okay, there's an important distinction there. Even if that war, even if that death is foreseen, okay, it's a question of did you adhere to proportionality and discrimination in the process of that? I'm, and I'm not advocating that you take advantage of that. The principle of double intention developed by Michael Walzer, a just war theorist, uh, theorist uh, argues that it's not enough just to tolerate the evil. You have to actively try to minimize the evil associated with that through what some people do. is like If there's a trajectory where you can drop a bomb in this case, but there may be an apartment building in that particular location, the pilot can assume risk, and this was done in Serbia, and fly around in a different direction and uh, uh, potentially lower the risk uh, associated with non-combatant casualties. So, uh, and proportionality, of course, is the correct weapon and the uh, uh, target selection. So, what I developed in this uh, three-year program uh, was 
software components. I design software architectures uh, for robotic platforms. One of them is referred to the ethical governor, named uh, loosely after uh, James Watt's uh, steam engine governor. Steam engine governor, as you probably all know, uh, it was intended when steam engines used to go too fast because they uh, uh, were not, uh, their RPM was not controlled. It was built on top of it to make sure that the speeds remained within the specifications required uh, for that system. Well, this is modeled in a similar way, almost a bolt-on addition to these kinds of platforms to ensure that they maintain within the behavioral, ethical behavioral specifications associated with it. That's the reason it was named. Other aspects include the ethical adapter, which uh, deals with uh, what happens if things go wrong in the battlefield, uh, and the responsibility advisor, which is used in pre-mission. So let me motivate this with a few examples, uh, scenarios as well, too. And I'll be curious to know your thoughts perhaps afterwards, maybe a dessert or whatever on some of these. Um, this one is an interesting one. Uh, I have a video of it, and hopefully you'll all be able to hear it. We have a story tonight yes, you that will. has to do with a single photograph. It's a surveillance photo taken in Afghanistan and obtained exclusively by NBC News. It's a photo of a gathering of Taliban fighters, but some say it shows more than that. Some say it shows what was a perfect opportunity to take out the enemy, but the military was unable to take the shot. The question is why? It was NBC News correspondent Kerry Sanders who obtained this photo exclusively. He reports for us tonight from Kabul. Brian, it took five days for the U.S. military to consider my request to declassify the photograph. It's a grainy still image that shows what some here in Afghanistan say was a lost opportunity to inflict serious damage on the Taliban. Army intelligence officers say the photo shows 190 members of the Taliban at a funeral two months ago. The U.S. Army claims among those in the formation, high-ranking members of the Taliban leadership. An unmanned armed predator like this one was spying on the group. Intelligence officers monitoring the scene in real time wanted to fire. They asked permission. The request went to intelligence analysts, senior commanders, and lawyers. But intelligence officers were told, no, they were not allowed to fire. Why? U.S. rules of engagement do not permit waging war in a cemetery. That was frustrating. Those individuals live to fight another day and uh, potentially uh, could uh, cause harm to our soldiers, uh, uh, civilians, uh, the population of the uh, government of Afghanistan. Despite frustration, U.S. military leaders here say the decision not to fire was the right one. Meantime, the Taliban fight by their own rules on Monday at a few... Whether you think that's right, or wrong, and we don't know the actual rules of engagement. The rules of engagement are classified uh, because you never tell your enemy exactly how you're going to fight under these uh, circumstances. And it's a no-brainer for a robot to do that if that was the rule of engagement. It's just simple GPS coordinate systems. You locate where the cemetery is and you are not allowed to fire in there. You don't have to call the Pentagon up uh, and ask, can I uh, shoot these people? If it's been declared illegal, it's illegal. Now, let's transpose that, whether it's a cemetery or not. Suppose they were standing on top of a hospital or in a mosque. That's clearly illegal to destroy cultural property uh, or uh, medical property under those sets of circumstances. There are things that can be marked. Those shots should not be taken. And it's easy to implement that in a robotic system. That's the easiest one to do. Okay, now let me get to a harder one, which is the next, which is that video that I spoke to. And if you want, you can probably find this on uh, YouTube uh, somewhere. It's called a brag video or war porn. Uh, it is sent back uh, from the battlefield, and that's indeed how I heard it at that meeting. I was sitting there uh, in a small group, uh, think brainstorming about how this agency can move forward, and one of the uh, fellows who was an active uh, a duty UAV pilot um, was just received some video, uh, evidently, and uh, heard some machine gun fire, what well, sounded like machine gun fire, coming from that, and as a good teacher, I said, would you share that with us? Uh, and so he plugged it in, uh, and some of my uh, academic colleagues uh, 
stomachs turned when they actually saw what was going on here. Uh, Apache helicopters, by the way, don't fire machine guns. They fire chain guns, which have mini cannon shells. And they, it's rather gruesome to see how they interact uh, with the human body uh, in terms of, uh, that's why I never show this video. Um, and I'll talk more about it later. But it brought up an interesting question of, was this an ethical action or not? And these were human soldiers in a Apache helicopter. What you had here are three insurgents, and we'll call them insurgents. I believe them to be insurgents. And I also have recently learned an acronym, IANAL. That stands for I am not a lawyer. So uh, I cannot, uh, uh, I have no legal opinion on this, uh, just uh, an understanding of, of the situation. They were uh, evidently planting, uh, exhibiting hostility uh, or uh, hostile intent by planting uh, IEDs, improvised explosive de devices, by the roadside, taken out of that truck. Apache helicopters from a distance are rather silent, actually. It was, uh, I had one pop up from a hill and was kind of frightening at a demo that we had uh, once. And uh, uh, they put their gun sight on the initial uh, individual and to use the military term, which I learned at that meeting, uh, that individual was neutralized. Um, uh, neutralized was not how I saw it, it was liquefied. But nonetheless, uh, it was, uh, the net effect uh, uh, was, that was, a, in my mind, a legal kill. Okay, this was a, a potential combatant. The next individual was standing around figuring, what? You know, kind of what's going on, like a deer in the headlights that appeared in the video. The gunner moved these, uh, the sights onto that individual and uh, neutralized him uh, as well. Then by this time, the third individual said, uh, well, he didn't say it, he jumped under the truck uh, at this point in time uh, to hide from whatever and wherever these uh, gunshots, uh, these cannon shells uh, were coming from. The gunner moved the uh, uh, sights adjacent to the truck, fired uh, correctly uh, at that point in time, and uh, the individual uh, at that point um, staggered out and collapsed. And I have to read it from here because I can't read it from there. It says, there's two voices uh, that are present. One is the person who is controlling the gun sight. And Apaches have a pilot and a gunner. Um, and, uh, but it sounded like it may have been a remote commander as well, too. I don't know if that was the guy inside the plane or uh, off board. But anyways, uh, the gunner was saying, want me to take the other truck out. That's legitimate war material, a legitimate target. It makes sense in that particular case to neutralize that uh, particular thing. It said, uh, the commander at that point said, Roger, uh, wait for move by the truck. Movement right there, said the gunner. I said, Roger, he's wounded. At that point in time, when someone says he's wounded, he's collapsed in a puddle, he no longer throws a, uh, poses a threat, that individual is hors de combat. That means he is no longer considered a legal combatant at that point in time. And he has been given non-combatant protection by virtue of his wound, according to the Geneva Conventions. Without hesitation, uh, the second voice says, hit him. Uh, voice one says, targeting the truck. The gunner was keeping the gun sights on that. Voice two, hit the truck and him. Go forward of it and hit him. And there was an audible weapons discharge after it has been done. That individual was neutralized as well. I had an interesting discussion with my colleagues as to whether that was a legitimate kill uh, uh, or not. And having spoken to this at many different meetings, which have included groups of JAG lawyers, I have asked them, would you want my robot to take that shot? And they said no. And I would not want my robot to take that shot either. The real question, and even if that individual, it's clearly stated in the laws of war, even an individual can be taken back by his own party, what you're supposed to do is call for help. And there are wonderful examples of military people that have done this. I could speak to the glories of the adherence to the laws of war by many of our soldiers as well, too. But in many cases, it's not done. And those are the ones that I worry about as well, too. Uh, we have to improve upon existing performance. So anyway, um, that's the bottom line of that. And then finally, uh, in Korea, as I mentioned, I spent time there and saw the DMZ. And I familiar, uh, visited this company a couple of times, Samsung Techwin. It's a division, not the same company that makes your TVs and cell phones. Uh, but they're, it's a, a wholly owned subsidiary, I guess, is the best uh, way to do it. But they made a platform which has an auto mode operation. For, and there is a line in the DMZ called the military demarcation line. There are fences everywhere. It says basically, don't go in here, or you'll be shot. 
And although we don't know the rules of engagement, if you step across that line, you can be shot. That's what exists. There's a war exists between the North and South uh, Korea. Well, we can make a robot do that, right? It's easy to make a robot do that. And Samsung Techwin has done that. One of the things you see with military hardware movies, there's always catchy music uh, uh, associated with that. This can see, uh, I believe, five kilometers away, track a human five kilometers away uh, at, in the daytime and two kilometers at night. The machine gun won't go that far, but the uh, uh, tracking uh, can occur. And what happens in the DMZ, there are the one of the places that the U.S. still allows landmine usage. We have landmines in the DMZ to slow if North Korea decides to come across uh, that particular area. One of the things you want to do is protect, oddly, the landmines uh, and the field because you could breach it with a, a strategy. So you create crossfire uh, that goes across uh, those landmines and these systems are intended to slow them down. You won't stop them, but just to slow them down before they come across. And in doing so, you may buy enough time to change the war. So uh, it's an interesting platform. Before, uh, Samsung Techwin has developed this whole system. It's not just a platform. It's a whole system of surveillance and monitoring. And it can be used in auto mode operation or in individual uh, or human controlled uh, operation. Um, but before that incident that they had uh, in uh, on that island where those civilians were killed, they couldn't sell any of them. Well, they sell, sold about four or six of them after that, and they got a pretty big order uh, more recently uh, as well, too, uh, for these things. To me, this is a legitimate use of autonomous lethal systems, where you have a situation where civilians can't get in, where war fighters are told, if you cross this line, you're going to be shot, and they should be able to do better discrimination than a landmine should. That's the real key. And if you can do those things and adhere to that, it seems a legitimate use of autonomy in my estimation, but that's just me. Other situations, we've worked at Fort Benning, things I'd like to see this used is in counter sniper operations. Uh, sniper operations are particularly dangerous uh, in urban settings. You've probably seen movies like Saving Private Ryan or uh, uh, this scene from Full Metal Jacket as well too, where uh, actually snipers often shoot to wound so that they're, uh, uh, which is illegal, <laughs> by the way. Uh, but uh, after they wound, they draw other soldiers to try and pull that soldier out uh, as well and, and gives a, a potential to increase uh, the number of casualties uh, accordingly. If you're interested on the individual results, and I am running out of time, uh, they're available on the website, these videos, some of which motivate the different scenarios that we have. Uh, you can go to uh, my webpage and find them off of that. Uh, go to the lab webpage and click under research and, uh, and multimedia and you can see them. They're, most of them are narrated as well too and they speak to these particular scenarios in different ways using the kinds of technology. But we are a long way, a long way from actually achieving, achieving this kind of capability, whether it's my way or somebody else's way. And I'm not saying this is the only way, I'm saying this is an attempt, one of the first attempts to be able to try and address this problem on behalf of non-combatants. There probably are many, many other ways to do it. And I encourage my colleagues to consider other ways in which we can use technology to better and more effectively protect non-combatant lives. And to do that, we need to answer a lot of really hard questions. There's a lot of hard questions associated with that. And that's just a, a few of them. And most interesting, about a year ago, um, uh, Wired uh, intercepted a, a classified uh, document uh, from Israel, and they were talking about developing ethical uh, algorithms for their drones uh, at some point in time. The point is, just as I mentioned before, if the military uses this or not, we probably won't know uh, because you don't want to know how you are going to fight. Are you going to do that? And if you have found this utterly and completely abhorrent, which you may have, the, the mere thought of a robot killing a human being, deliberately. Well, there's hope for you. Uh, in international humanitarian law, uh, there is a clause called the Martin's Clause, which basically says that, summarizing, weapons which violate the dictates of the public conscience may also be prohibited on that basis alone. 
the, the uh, uh, Human Rights Watch is trying to figure out how to make that work. So if you find it utterly abhorrent, there you go. But the trouble is, no lawyer knows what the dictates of the public conscience are uh, right now. And until that's handled, it's going to just stay kind of uh, in limbo because you've got to get all these nation, nation actors sitting at a table agreeing what the dictates of the public conscience are, not only for this case, but for all future cases uh, as well. But this clause has appeared ever since the beginning of the uh, uh, international humanitarian law or the Geneva Conventions. So summarizing, we're not there yet. Maybe we shouldn't be there. You need to think about this. That's part of why I'm talking about this. I'm giving you my perspective, but I'm sure you all have your own as well, too. I encourage my colleagues, the roboticists, to think about this and recognizing that you are, they are actually, and if any of you are roboticists uh, as well, too, they are actively contributing, whether they take money from the military or not. Because if you have a good idea, someone, Somewhere, someday, we'll take that idea and put it to work in a military system. If you've got a bad idea, don't worry about it. You know, if you're doing bad stuff, you don't, have to, you don't have to think about that. And we need to be proactive about the management. And I hope to actually extend the architecture for use in uh, other domains. Interestingly, we're looking at, uh, uh, we have a proposal out with a colleague from Tufts in uh, uh, the management of uh, uh, various kinds of diseases. It, it, I can't, I'm probably suffering it from right now because I can't remember it. So it's not Alzheimer's, it was a different one as well too, but uh, it generates uh, a, a facial masking uh, in individuals. So there you go. Uh, so if you want more information, uh, I have a book on the subject as well, um, and that has a lot of technical details. It's more like a research monograph, uh, a variety of other things uh, also, and I want to thank you for your time today. Yes. I think the notion of the 